episode 152. We back. New year. Same podcast. So make sure you go on YouTube. Support our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash hellblackpod. Go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash hellblackpod. Like, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcast at. We should be there. If we ain't, <laughs> let us know. But be sure to go to that Patreon, patreon.com slash hellblackpod. We got a lot of great content coming for y'all this month, next month, this whole year. Inshallah, you know, we're going to make it shake. Hey, our YouTube channel for sure needs some love. Um, I guess you could put most of the onus on us because <laughs> we are inconsistent. Yeah. But- Regardless, I mean, if you think about, we it, found it. We, you know, that's why we adjusting, man. We're yeah. gonna we're gonna show that channel some love, so be sure to go subscribe to that thing, man. But if you approach the podcast like you would a book uh, or any other um, the thing you use to study, yeah. you wouldn't just listen to it one time. You wouldn't just view it one time. And so uh, there are episodes that you should go back and revisit on our YouTube channel to help us get those views up. Yeah, I'll be re-listening to them sometimes too to see. Ways we can do better. I'm like, hey, we got some gems on there. Oh my man, kind of be spitting sometimes, you know. You can't take it personal too. It's yeah. a, a lot of nonsense on YouTube that a people lot. have to have to filter through. A lot of political nonsense. I'll be seeing some Huey speeches or like Huey interviews or George yeah. Jackson interviews that's been up for uh, you know seven years on like the Afro Marxist page and like it got six thousand views. That's what I'm saying. So <laughs> who do, who am I to feel <laughs> real revolutionary? Slighted. Theoreticians, yeah. you know what I'm saying? If that's how you say the word. <laughs> Who am I to feel slighted that, you know, our episode has been up for a month generally has 256 views. Yeah. But also, all it takes is one one person who we got to spark, uh, who could possibly start a, a cadre. And then, and then have, serve hundreds of, me- hundreds of meals, start a grocery program. So I farm, am grateful you know, so it's- for the 256 views. I actually shouldn't <laughs> even talk about what we don't have. I should focus on what we do have. So shout out to the folks that have been supporting. Shout out to all the patrons. And- I uh, echo your sentiments as it pertains to uh, the strides and the intention that we're trying to uh, reapproach our podcast with. Yeah, and so I'm I'm excited to see what, what we're able to produce and for us to really prioritize this element of political education for our organization. Yeah, you know, this is an organizational uh, project, and it should be treated as such. Definitely, you know? so we're gonna put some time and energy into it. Especially because a lot of people, if you talk to them who come into the doors, a lot of times they get familiar with us through Hello Black. Oh, you sure. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. A lot of our funding has came through the podcast and the efforts of making media accessible to transform people's minds from a, a colonial mentality to a revolutionary mentality. You know, so for us, we uh, looking back and trying to make the adjustments, you know, for our longtime listeners, this ain't the first time you've heard this. Yeah. <laughs> it might not be the last yeah. <laughs> because we always making adjustments. You know, we, uh, what they call revolutionary scientists are aiming to be revolutionary scientists mm-hmm. and, and trying to make the uh, necessary changes to bring y'all a, a good show, a, a well-produced show, uh, where y'all can really think with us and hopefully build, you know, cause like Delincey was saying, we got a whole program. <laughs> this ain't just us talking. This ain't just us, you know, discussing news. This ain't just us theorizing. Really, it's about us uh, trying to ground everybody who's listening uh, into creating uh, revolutionary decolonization programs in their locale uh, to ultimately serve the people and transform our condition from a colonial condition to a, a condition where we is a uh, free, free human beings. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, where our humanity is actually respected. So all it takes is a little look outside. Yeah. <laughs> all it takes is a look on CNN to see where we at. I don't know about CNN, but you know what I'm saying? That <laughs> shows the contradictions that we was dealing with. Even as it pertains just to today, I'm excited about today's episode. Uh, the content we'll be covering, talking about, you know, containment strategies uh, and counterinsurgency and giving our analysis on, uh, I would say, what's taking place on the Red Sea, right? Mm-hmm. This is... Of course, been all over mainstream media, uh, but if you get seen mainstream the, media in the West, the reactionary <laughs> propaganda from the West trying to save the West and yeah. save its capitalist interests. If you're getting your if you're getting <laughs> your information from, you know, the Washington Post, the New York Times, SF Chronicle, NBC, Fox News, anywhere, well, any one of these Western media conglomerates, mm-hmm. or yeah. uh, any place that is in the pocket or the palm of the West, yeah. because they're in their pocket. 
Whether it be uh, Instagrams, algorithms. You know, you're probably getting some lies. <laughs> yeah. Or you're getting one side of the story. So Half truths. With us, we always try to provide things as objectively speaking because we recognize that in order to uh, rid the world of pollution, rid the world of exploitation, uh, rid the world of genocide, rid the world of all the inhumane uh, manifestations of capitalism uh, and in imperialism, you know, capitalism in its international form, we have to look up things objectively. And so while the West has its of its uh, desire to give you half truths, like you said, to uh, spread misinformation, we're going to try to give you just the objective mm -hmm. facts. Of course, with our um, new African, you know, on thoughts and processes. Mm -hmm. I think the new African way is the true way. So it's very objective. It's very objective. It's very, very uh, logical and rational. So, you know, it's, it's even science. if you don't subscribe to the new African independence movement, you're going to get you some real truth. Hey, and we're going to put it into reality through our work, through our organizing, you know? So, again, appreciate y'all. Appreciate the people who've been listening uh, episode after episode. You know, it'll still be kind of wild when people come back and be like, hey, I just listened to episode three. <laughs> hey, I just listened to episode two, you know? Uh, and able to get some insight from that, you know. So, can I plug an episode real quick? Yeah, go ahead. I think that was a great segue because I wrote it down to make sure I didn't forget. Um, like in the midst of like all the screenings, uh, and then us trying to keep up to date and provide analysis on uh, the Palestinian liberation struggle in its uh, latest phase, we did a podcast with Darius that. Mm. I don't even know if did we promote it. So, yeah, I, I don't think we promoted it. Yeah. yeah. Should we even promoted the last podcast? Yeah. So, so I, episode one fifty one. You should definitely tap in with that. That's our late. That's our previous episode. That's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then you should tap in to episode one hundred and forty six, featuring uh, Darius, who is a excuse me, a member of People's Programs. He sits on our central committee. And, also a bureau lead. Yeah, and he also is a poet. A writer. So if you've tapped into any of the Free the People Press magazines, um, you're familiar with Darius's work. If you follow him on Instagram, Twitter, you're familiar with his work. Uh, if you see all the garden stuff that we do in people's programs, you know, that's led by him and AB. So y'all tap into episode 146. And I think anyone that's interested in organizing and being able to commit to organization and develop as an individual and as an organizer, I think Darius. Uh, Darius's episode is a good look into uh, what that process has been like for somebody trying to develop into a professional revolutionary in the 21st century mm -hmm. and the uh, you know domestic neo colony. So tap into that for sure. I think uh, yeah, this episode is as timely as ever uh, for a multitude of reasons. Right, whether we're talking about. Um, Again, the new heights that the Palestinian liberation struggle is is reaching, or if we're talking about uh, twenty twenty four elections that's about to happen, right? We were definitely going to be seeing uh, some counterinsurgency and some containment strategies. Uh, uh, so I think us being able to remind folks of what that looks like, and or uh, introduce the strategies and tactics of uh, racist of capitalist, um, so that they can. Be prepared for what they're about to see as it is. I think it's safe to say, like it's going to go into a, like hyperdrive. Is that fair to say? Oh yeah. yeah. So prepare folks for for what's to come uh, and allowing them to make sense of what's already happened. And so starting with that, uh, we've named we already named the term a few times now. Uh, but what is counterinsurgency? And I think it's also important for you to talk about the uh, ideology that governs yeah. it. I mean, the counter counterinsurgency is the state using tactics any tactics that is available to the state to be able to squash a rebellion, mm -hmm. to be able to uh, squash revolution, right? So we oftentimes see a uh, military response to counterinsurgencies, whether it's the National Guard deploying, whether it's the police departments deploying, we see the intelligence apparatus of the FBI, the CIA, uh, stirring up trouble, usually uh, through informants, through mm -hmm. rats, uh, being deployed into revolutionary organizations or uh, revolutionary groups that is seeking to uh, free to land right so they'll use rats to do the work and cause issues inside uh so it can you know self-collapse oftentimes we see uh economic aspects of counterinsurgencies as well uh whether that be funding groups like the us organization uh to essentially be able to counter the black panther party 
right? Uh, so seeing that economic aspect of them flooding money to reactionary organizations, reactionary groups to essentially, uh, you know, contain uh, a revolutionary organization or get them into an inner scene feud with another organization in the street. So we uh, is not actually targeting the state, even though it's a, <laughs> essentially can become a puppet of the state, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, we see a, a social aspect to a counterinsurgency through reactionary propaganda through the state that is going to delegitimize armed resistance, right? We see that time and time again. You feel me? They try to make the Black Panther Party seem crazy. They tried to make the Black Liberation Army uh, seem even more crazy because they took up guns and uh, militantly responded, right? So essentially, counterinsurgency is, is, is quelling a rebellion, is quelling a revolution in the streets, um, by any means that they see necessary to be able to stop and to preserve uh, the status quo, which is capitalist imperialism, right? So that is what is governing it, is capitalism. It's imperialism, right? Uh, it's uh, oftentimes right now, uh, it's neocolonialism, right? Mm -hmm. So essentially, uh, you know, funding someone who might look like you, but ain't nothing like you, and is actually working for the neocolonial, the colonial interests uh, of the United States of America. So they might uh, get their token Negro, you feel me, they... They token Mexican, you feel me? They token Asian, they token indigenous person uh, to essentially be a mouthpiece for the state, right? So we see that with, you know, a Barack Obama, a Kamala Harris, a Colin Powell, a Condoleezza Rice, right? All those people become these quote unquote icons that they try to use and say, oh, if you a new African, you should be like this. Right? That is also a part of like a, a counter uh, insurgent integrationist tactic uh, to be able to get people to buy into the state, right? So a lot of it is getting people is to squash the rebellion, then to get people to buy into the state apparatus um, and become involved in the, the quote unquote democratic machine. Yeah, so it's safe to say that uh, a containment or counter counterinsurgency is pretty much like the strategy and tactics of uh, shit repression. You feel me? It's their science. <laughs> yeah. It's their science and them deploying their science. You feel me? This has always been uh, a part of this quote unquote uh settler colonial nation it's been a part of uh transatlantic slave trade we we could always you know use an analysis like this and apply it in different times of history in terms of capitalist imperialism in my opinion can right? you expand a little bit more on uh i mean you you mentioned the black panther party but what was the actual practice of counter I mean, you talked about like rats and infiltration but yeah. what are some other elements of counterinsurgency that we saw within yeah. the black uh black power movement yeah well if we look at the COINTELPRO, right? Uh, the J. Edgar Hoover program that started off as, you know, some anti-communism, right? Uh, started off uh, with attacking uh, Marcus Garvey, which ultimately led to him being deported. Uh, if we look at COINTELPRO, the uh, strategies and tactics was to destroy and prevent <laughs> the rise of the Black Messiah, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with whatever tactic that they see fit, right? So if we look... We could look at part of the counterintelligence program, especially if you look at Oakland, uh, the removal of Merritt College, where you feel me, from mm -hmm. the flatlands in North Oakland up into the hills of East Oakland, right? Mm -hmm. We could see it also as this war on 7th Street in, mm -hmm. the, in, in West Oakland, taking out the resources that were in the community, right? Building a BART, right? Uh, building the post office, building the interstate. Like those are all a part of like a counterinsurgent tactic uh, in an economic way where we're talking about this. Uh, funding this economic funding of quote unquote new initiatives to develop land to develop uh, uh land and space in a way that now buys into the greater project of capitalist imperialism right so it's taking those resources out transforming it and now you have europeans uh gentrifiers coming in and taking up the resource right so that's a part of like uh counterinsurgent strategy as well as like through COINTEL pro you also had drugs being put into the community Right. The CIA, the cocaine intelligence agency, <laughs> bringing in drugs uh, and then getting, you know, new African revolutionaries hooked on drugs. Right. Uh, alcohol being readily available. Right. That was all a part of the uh, uh, counterinsurgency. Right. Yeah. Uh, disinformation campaigns, you know, uh, lying on the leaders, you know, what I'm saying creating whisper campaigns, um, snitch jacketing, you know, what I'm saying all these different tactics were being used essentially uh, as a counterinsurgent strategy to stop a revolutionary nationalist organization uh, from freeing the land from uh, these capital Euro-American capitalist imperialists. So it's a wide range of tactics, a wide range of strategies, uh, assassinations, character assassinations, uh, 
you know, creating neocolonial actors, mm -hmm. uh, rats, informants, uh, you know, setting people up, incarcerating, uh, creating political prisoners, prisoners of war, deportations, <laughs> right? Any tactic they will use uh, to destroy the movement, you know, as a part of counterinsurgency. Yeah, when you talk about, I think these, when we think when we think about counterinsurgency and containment strategies, right, the ones that really really pop out are always going to be COINTELPRO, mm -hmm. uh, and all the vicious tactics that fall under that. Whether you're talking about frame ups, whether you're talking about uh, disinformation campaigns, whether you're talking about assassinations, right, um, and then of course we can you just name the historical uh, implications of gentrification. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the role that that plays in preventing people, preventing, uh, well, we're going to speak on Black people for this, right? The role that it has played from preventing Black people from building community, mm -hmm. right? And having resources within that community to help uh, build some of those uh, institutions and organizations for self-determination, right? Yeah. Like removing Merrick College to the hills. Uh, but I think one that we, all, that we often talk about, uh, whether it's just you and I, or also I think it just comes up in general, mm -hmm. um, in spaces that are trying to provide political education is the nonprofit industrial complex straight up right like it comes up but i still don't think we fully wrapped our mm -hmm. heads around the role that this is you the role that mm -hmm. nonprofits play as an uh counterinsurgency and containment as a counterinsurgency tactic as a means to employ the containment strategy yeah all right so can you uh expand on that a little more because i think especially when you talk about neocolonialism right. and this yeah. uh ploy to integrate and to get people involved in the framework of mm -hmm. capitalism, I still don't think we fully sure comprehend it. Yeah, I mean, that is a part, of, again, the, the counterinsurgency as well as, you know, like that containment strategy of it, right? So it's uh, about quelling the revolution, but then oftentimes it's also about creating a pseudo revolution, you feel me, to funnel the people into this quote unquote democratic change making machine that they call the nonprofit industrial complex, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, nonprofits go back you know, uh, in the early 1900s to some degree, right? But we see really uh, the expansion of them as a counterinsurgency really around, you know, like the 1960s, mm -hmm. right? So you see this whole type of quote unquote war on poverty, right? Yeah. Which we also know was a, a vehicle to hyper incarcerate new African peoples, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but through the war on poverty, there was essentially these quote unquote social programs that were being created uh, to kind of create this quote unquote social safety net uh, that would essentially, you know, because if we look at what the party was doing, the party was creating survival programs pending revolution. This is right? what we'll do to feed the people until we overthrow the government. You feel me? To provide for so the people until we overthrow the government. They see, you know, young new Africans, you know, Berayon, shotgun, <laughs> leather jacket, mm -hmm. and galvanizing the community because they're taking care of the community. Uh, and it's working as a strategy, as a political strategy to be able to actually make change in the community. The state was like, OK, we see what they are doing. How do we now, as the state, create certain programs to co-opt the revolutionary uh, potential of the Black Panther Party and now create uh, these fascist <laughs> social welfare programs to be able to quell any form of revolution? Mm -hmm. Right. So this is where we see the rise. Right. So we talk about, you know, kids being fed for the, uh, at schools um, by the Black Panther Party. Right. That was one of the most popular programs. You feel me? Mm -hmm. Then what happened with the state is now, okay, the state is going to co-op that and say, oh, no, we're going to feed the kids now. Come to school. Right? So it's a project of essentially getting people to buy back into this oppressive system because they're caring about you in a social welfare type of way to protect the interests of capitalist imperialism. Right? Uh, so they're feeding you based off of that. So you then buy into the state and you say, hey, actually, you know, they're taking care of my material needs just to a certain amount to where it's actually going to prevent me from rising up. It's going to prevent me from engaging in revolutionary activity. Um, and they have it down to a certain science. But this is a product of fascism, right? Because then as they need this money, you feel me, to stop the rebellion here in the streets, then we see the United States go overseas to make up that profit margin. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we see that with the war on poverty. Then in the 1970s, and the 1980s, where uh, the privatization of public resources through neoliberalism, mm -hmm. uh, this is really where we see like a huge rise in the nonprofit industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Right. So we see the government began investing uh, in these social welfare programs at uh, exponential rate. You feel me? Investing in these nonprofits to now where the government isn't seen as responsible in a way. Right. So nonprofits now came in to fill these, quote unquote, uh, social welfare gaps. Right. 
Um, and this is where we see the rise of this, uh, what some might call corporate uh, philanthropy, right? To where now corporations, and then we know that the U.S. government is, uh, according to U.S. law, is a corporation. Corporations are now able to dictate where funding goes, right? Uh, corporations are able to influence the type of work that nonprofits are doing within this capitalist superstructure, this capitalist imperialist superstructure, oh, yeah. right? So now you have essentially you had revolutionary energy now being co-opted through a counterinsurgent strategy and putting uh, the revolutionary energy now into the nonprofit industrial complex, right? To where now you have a nine to fives in terms of maintaining the social we welfare state. And mm -hmm. this gives the state what I would call kind of like a buffer zone. You feel me? Um, where the state is now like, oh, we're not responsible. We just gave hundreds of millions of dollars to nonprofits to stop homelessness. We're not responsible. We just gave uh, we millions of dollars we uh, to stop uh, to help drug rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Right. We yeah. put out millions upon millions of dollars through uh, a Facebook <laughs> sponsored school, a charter school to make education better. Right. So now it's uh, where the quote unquote government is able to re re uh, remove itself from a sense of social responsibility. You feel me? Uh, if we talk about a revolutionary government, it has a, a responsibility to communalism, as a responsibility responsibility to egalitarianism. Egalitarianism. Now, this capitalist government saying, "No, we gave you nonprofits." You feel me? These nonprofits are now responsible for the social good of a society, right? So now, like if we look at Acorn, Acorn is ran by a nonprofit now, rather than actually the government being uh, running Acorn. You know what I'm saying? To where now the nonprofit is more so responsible. And now the government doesn't have to stay to a certain uh, regulatory compliance, mm -hmm. you know. So this is a, yeah, this is a, a part of that larger counterinsurgent strategy. And now, you know, in 2023, we've seen the nonprofit industrial complex turn into an area where you know it's about careers, right? It's a reliance on the government for funding. It's a reliance on corporations for funding that essentially are being are dictating exactly what you can and can't do as a nonprofit. Right. To where now people become so invested in the nonprofit industrial complex, they don't actually want to see it in. You know what I'm saying? Because the people are making millions of dollars. You feel me? Running nonprofits. People are making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars running nonprofits. You feel me? Like you said, it's the livelihood. It becomes a career. So you actually don't want to. You want to put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound rather than you feel me stitching up the wound. And going through physical therapy and becoming 100 percent as a new human being healed up <laughs> you actually just put in a band-aid and you want that wound to keep on bleeding more and more you feel me so then you can buy a bucket to <laughs> keep the blood and then you do something you sell the blood like these motherfuckers do type shit you know what i'm saying i mean the, the name the the goal is in the name it's an industry the point of industry is me? to turn the raw material into a finished product to like, be bought and sold it's bought and sold it's ultimately commerce. we try as revolutionaries we're trying to put ourselves out of work you feel me like we're trying to build a society, build a culture, uh, 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 ethos system, a system of, of morality mm -hmm. that where all the people are invested in social change, all the people are invested uh, in egalitarianism to where now all the people are doing the work for the sake of humanity versus us now trying to build an organization, uh, build up these decolonization programs. Now it's all the people are involved. We essentially put ourselves out of work and now the people mm -hmm. are in full control of their own destiny. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, this this is why it's, it's such a danger because it's like, hey, you know, you uh, go to college, you get you get your degree, and you know, you see yourself as socially conscious. Then you get a job at a nonprofit, and now you know, in college, you might have been revolutionary talking about free to land. Now you're talking about fund this grant. <laughs> and I'm only ain't... voting for those hey. who, who vote. I'm only voting for those who say free Palestine. Feel me? So this is what, you know, we was dealing with a, a certain yeah. uh, bourgeoisie mentality, you feel me, of a people who want to see, quote unquote, uh, social progression in society, but it's still bought into neoliberalism. They still bought into capitalism, even though they ain't capitalist themselves, but they comfortable with getting these crumbs. You know what I'm saying? If you want to use a quote unquote Marxist terminology, we're talking about a, a bourgeoisie of the proletariat. That's what we're seeing right now is people still invested in these crumbs of capitalism at the expense of who? The third world. The masses. At Man. the expense of who? <laughs> yeah. You feel me? The poorest, the poor, and the quote unquote uh, of the new African community, right? Or the quote unquote lumping proletariat. You feel yeah. me? I mean, we, we you've we have to see that historically, uh, the nonprofit industrial complex, uh, these social programs, are nothing more than reforms that are born of the that are in response to a rise of consciousness, right? When you talk about the early 1900s, 
uh, where you get like uh, the New Deal under Roosevelt, right? Where it's like, okay, we need a new relations. We need a new set of relations with the people, right? Like the people's consciousness mm-hmm. are raising post the Great Depression, post World War One, right? Like this shit can't be the same way. The people are going to, going to start to demand yeah. more, especially as you see the wealthy beginning to get more, right? And so where we see uh, the nonprofit industrial complex make this like quantitative and qualitative leap in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, like, like you're referring to, is because the Black Panther Party uh, exposed the contradictions of the social programs that hadn't really been revamped probably since the New Deal, right? And so uh, the goal of NGOs is to provide uh, resources within the framework of capitalism, right? Uh, Again, aid quote unquote within the framework of capitalism none right. of it is all none of it ever <laughs> talks about let's create a more equitable system mm. that removes this uh hundreds of families owning 90 percent of the world's wealth right no, no, non-profits don't do that they say mm. let's uh let's just funnel more money from this system into these programs that again will do nothing is reform at, at its basis it's reform uh, and then i think you make a really good point the, something that again we don't talk about enough is the brain drain hmm. that happens from these nonprofit industrial mm. complex where you get some of the most brightest, the most skilled now serving the state. Mm-hmm. Right? That's, that, that's what happens. You got some of your best and brightest minds with their time that uh, are needed for the for, new African nation you know, that are accounted for, that, that are needed for some of these more grassroots initiative initiatives now, you know, uh working for these working for these organizations that'll do nothing more than uh, pander to local and national politicians. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you talk about, I think another element that's that's often missed out in terms of, you know, what uh, Nkuma calls like the welfare state yeah. is the role that this plays uh, internationally, right? Because the goal of capitalism, these people, when you look at the board of these NGOs, right? When you look at the board, uh, they are tend to be people that have a keen interest Mm. in uh, profit and surplus value, right? And making the most money they possibly can. And so if I'm going to put 10 million into some grant, I need to get a hundred million somewhere else. Yeah. And how does that happen? Exploitation of the third Mm. world. Like yeah, yeah Shell, yeah, the other yeah, Gates Foundation to put a hundred million dollars towards here. They finna go make three hundred million off the Congo. They using the NGOs <laughs> straight create, up uh, a superstructure, and where they're able to extract the resources from the continent under the name of quote unquote nonprofit, <laughs> under the quote uh, quote unquote development. You feel me? They're able to extract resources, right? Yeah. So essentially, what they're doing is money laundering. Yeah, Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. <laughs> I'm sure if you look at his his shit, he probably give hundreds of millions of dollars. Elon, Jeff Bezos, they got to. They, they, I mean, they have to to watch their money. They have to so they to, have get to watch their money and to keep and the to, people docile, mm, straight up, so that they can continue to what make profit. You feel me? We got to give you like that's why I say they have a science down to their thing. You feel me? They have a science. They have a, a methodology into where they're able to. Uh, Test the people and see, okay, if we give you just this much, do you revolt? If we give you this much, what is your thought pattern? You know what I'm saying? And like a lot we, of these groups are tend to be ran by folks from these communities. It's like you we they trust you. Like you grew up here. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure to I have some sort of legitimacy here in the town. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been here. There are people who can say, I've known that nigga since he was a kid. I know his grandma. I knew when they was having the PRA <laughs> or they was coming and performing at the Sweet Sweet 16 for yeah. free. They was holding the cleat checks. They was giving like, yeah, niggas have created some form of legitimacy. So now if we go and take $100 million from the Gates Foundation, people will have to assume that we know something they don't know, that this must be for the betterment of the city. Yeah, That's, that's what they'll assume. And people are able to uh you know ride the tide of a legacy of mm. organ there are some folks who've been now you talk about me and that's only seven years now what about the people who've been here and who are 50 years old who've been organized and yeah. open for 20 years mm-hmm. who can say they great they great great grandpa was a longshoreman they great granny worked at oakland tech and worked at fremont and worked at frick and worked yeah. at hoover and worked at harriet tell me used to work at the ymca they cousin played that skyline. There is some legitimacy there. So yeah, you should look into me to run this city. Why wouldn't mm-hmm. I have? Why wouldn't I want the most for it? Right? I look like you. I'm from here. Whole time with their allegiance to capitalism. 
<laughs> Ain't that some backwards ass thing though? Cause you you have a like an allegiance to capitalism. But you ain't even a capitalist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you, I mean, you know? Amir Khan Cabral told us a while ago, you can be, um, uh, you can be in allegiance with the class you aspire to be. Yeah, no, but that's you know? what, such a backwards way of thinking. You know what I'm saying? Like, you were talking about that, like, colonial neurosis. Like, you can actually get with the people. Existence. You feel me? Get with the people, align with the people. And if the masses of people are in control of their own destiny, you actually materially is going to be better off. You feel me? Like, you will have a better life. For the future generations of your family, like if you actually really apply the science to it all. But hey, you know, it's easy to get that crumb first, you know what I'm saying, and be so caught up in this uh, <laughs> material world of capitalism, so caught up in the uh, indoctrination process of wanting to be a part of this thing that you can't even understand your sense of reality. And some people's whole, you know, a lot of folks be having that like missionary complex, mm. you know, like this. Like their whole motive is like this pseudo altruistic thing. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people get power through feeling like it's like a god complex in a sense, right? Like a lot of these presidents and CEOs, like Clarence, you know, <laughs> feel me? They be having they be having god complexes though. Like they get there and not from like a pure way where it's like I feel like I'm contributing to society, right? That real like that uh that that. That, egotistical yeah but like uh, it's the opposite of mm. uh, what's at the core of like a true socialist that mm. true revolutionary humanist like i yeah. see you you feel me like as I a human you. being like i got this love for you you feel me because i, I, I got me, the love so for I myself love you, I, you I love feel you, me? so i love me and i want us to have the same thing that's Straight not necessarily up. what it is it's more so like i, I get realize off. that i can get or you know capitalism is about what uh about status it's about uh feeding the ego having mm. this sense of importance okay the NGO has created a lane for feeding the ego, quote unquote, in the name of people. Mm -hmm. So that's why you get people like, I do this, I do that, we do this, we do that, I do this, I do that. And that's why I try to be so careful uh, around like how I present myself. Mm. And that's why I've always been grateful, you know, for the like the music shit is because I can always just tell people I work in music versus like my whole identity being wrapped up in service of people or some like, especially in this, in this neoliberal shit, you got to be careful, right? Like I still have the aspirations of being what Jaleel would consider like a professional revolutionary, but you got to just be careful about how you spew this shit because a lot of these niggas ain't doing nothing but uh, stroking their egos mm. uh, under the guise of serving the masses, right? So I, I think with all of this, y'all, we got to recognize the nonprofit industrial complex is nothing more than an industry, right? It's uh, trying to turn this idea and this process of revolution into commerce, mm. <laughs> period, point blank. Uh, it's being used as a tool for neoliberalism, like you said earlier, where the state can claim it's doing its job yeah. by funneling millions upon millions of hundreds of millions of dollars into these quote unquote grassroots initiatives that actually do nothing to uh, attack capitalism domestically or in its international form imperialism. Right? These are all things we have to understand or these things are going to continue to reach new heights if we don't. They're going to continue to reach new heights. And, uh, you know, it's imperative that we talk about how it's going to play out now with the uh, current stage of the Palestinian liberation movement. Mm -hmm. We saw it play out. We got to see it up close and personal in 2020 mm -hmm. with Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Where hundreds of million dollars, they got $100 million? Like, um, like 90 something. Yeah, I think but it was, I know, it, I know but it was we know it was hundreds of millions being, you know. It, it was upwards, right? Uh, where you get ninety million dollars going into the Black Lives Matter, and I don't know what they've done on like a programmatic level. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm pretty sure you just you just don't hear nothing from it, right? You had all yeah. these people who were able to capitalize off that time period of 2020 of the protests and get these book deals and have done nothing but pretty much like build their own careers, mm -hmm. uh, careers and brands. You know, we we, we saw it, and, and it, it's is I think was so nasty about the Palestinian shit though is that there are people who are going to benefit from this here who don't have, like, at least, you know, what was happening during 2020 was, like, a domestic thing. You know, like, at least you mm. somewhat, like, there is a chance that, you know, even if you is a black neo-colonial agent and you running your little nonprofit, there is yeah. still a chance that your ass to get put over and get shot by the police. Yeah. <laughs> you niggas, a lot of these niggas who making, who building off, the pain of the folks in Palestine ain't never gonna touch, ain't gotta deal with the level of repression, the, la the level of mm -hmm. trust. That's what's the nastiest about that, about that shit. Mm -hmm. Is that you never gonna have to come in contact with the IDF. 
You feel me? Like yeah. you're never gonna have to really feel the full brunt of the missiles uh, that are being sent over there from the U.S. and the rest of the NATO countries. You feel mm -hmm. me? Like uh, that's what like that's that's the element of nastiness that was absent from 2020. We're like, okay, there was still a uh, know, yeah yeah. It's there's like, still an element that some of these niggas could get smoked at a protest. Could get could you know, like you get black, you get pulled over. You, there's still some shit that you got that some of these niggas I deal with. But like here, a lot of these it's, it's a different building, type of you know, war. It's a different type it's of nasty, war. It's bro. just a nasty work. Yeah. But again, that goes back to like the containment strategy. You know what I'm saying? Of of containing uh, revolutionary energy. You know what I'm saying? Right? Because that's what really that containment strategy goes back to the Soviet times, right? You had the uh, State Department uh, advisor and quote unquote Soviet expert, uh, George Keenan, essentially describe a policy that would uh, stop like a domino effect of the spread of communism. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so we've seen that. And it can largely be characterized as economic aid. So, yeah, it's just going back to this containment strategy, really, which has its roots, uh, you know, through the State Department, uh, creating through George Keenan to describe essentially like a policy uh, that would prevent the quote unquote domino effect uh, of the spread of communism. Right. So they essentially have used the same containment strategy in different time periods, but that's when it's. Uh, was really like developed and mm -hmm. uh, and coined, right? Um, to essentially prevent <laughs> the rise of communism, uh, the rise of socialism, right? So you've seen like through the Marshall Plan, like large scale uh, economic aid uh, to rebuild quote unquote Western Europe and prevent communist movements um, from gaining support in the aftermath of World War II. You know what I'm saying? We've seen that containment strategy being uh, deployed uh, in Africa. You feel me? of the U.S. being able to come in as the biggest victor of World War II and essentially put neo-colonial uh, grips over the African continent uh, and control all the resources, control the leadership and install pawns. You feel me? So we've seen this neo-colonial strategy that really is characterized by heavy aid, uh, heavy financial control of, you know, even Western European countries mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, where the U.S. has the grip on that. Uh, we've seen this as like containing you know, communism. And now they use this same containment strategy that's being used even historically to just stop revolutions. You feel me? So this is what we're seeing right now, <laughs> which we've seen historically uh, of containing the Black Panther Party, of containing uh, the Black Liberation Army, right? Of, even before they coined the term containment strategy, you could even apply that same analysis to what they did to Marcus Garvey, mm -hmm. right? Containing the movement uh, and then, you know, essentially providing economic aid to support the rise of a new movement to support the rise of a state controlled <laughs> uh, neo-colonial leaders and neo-colonial governments. Right. So we've seen that really being uh, deployed during the Black Lives Matter movement. Right. This counterinsurgency and containment strategy, uh, essentially of using state backed people who are new African uh, who have allegiance to the state uh, to do the job of the state and to get the new African masses to essentially uh have that revolutionary fervor and that revolutionary fire you know these neocolonial <laughs> agents come in with fire trucks and pour water over it you know what i'm saying so understanding that aspect of how it happened in black lives matter we've seen the revolutionary you feel me fervor the revolutionary fire of people in the streets of ferguson you feel me the darren seals you feel me who was assassinated by the government but then you see the deployment uh, people in blue vests <laughs> coming in and taking the spotlight and then saying, oh, I'm going to run for city council. I'm going to go come vote for me. Right. Oh, come be a part of the uh, Democratic Party. Right. So we've seen a lot of times with these organizations coming in funded by the government <laughs> or funded uh, by corporate interests coming in and saying, oh, no, we are the legitimate people. We are the legitimate actors. We are the le legitimate structures in which new African people should be involved in in order to organize, quote unquote, organize. But that organization is always going back into the state. Right. So we've seen that deploy <laughs> in Black Lives Matter. Right. We've seen these NGOs being deployed, these nonprofits being deployed and getting people involved in, quote unquote, civic engagement within the settler colony. Right. So instead of people talking about we trying to overthrow the police, we trying to free the land, we trying to start a revolution. Now we see the deployment of these NGOs saying, no, the revolution is through a ballot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. We're going to get involved and we're going to vote and we're going to do this reform and we're going to do this policy change versus now nah, we just trying to free the land. Now nah, we trying to abolish the police. Now it's like, oh, we actually trying to become the police in a different type of way what? <laughs> and police the people through a nonprofit. You feel me where it's like, 
oh, we're going out here. We're going to be peaceful. If you do anything that's not peaceful, we are going to quote unquote peace police you. You know what I'm saying? We're going to have people, our own people invest doing our own security. And we're going to you know, make sure that y'all is not doing anything that is a threat to the state. Right. So it's, again, this containment strategy to where we're seeing <laughs> the same thing now being done in the uh, Palestine, Palestinian liberation movement here in the U.S. Right. The same tactics that was used on BLM is now being used on in the, in, uh, in the Palestinian liberation movement. Right. So we saw even one thing we saw with BLM was this idea that it was somehow a moral thing to voluntarily get arrested. Right. You voluntarily put yourself in handcuffs, get arrested and then use paying the state thousands of dollars to go to bail or to get bail. You feel me? And they did this in the BLM movement was shutting down the Bay Bridge, like shutting it down and then getting arrested and then paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in bail fee to get put out, then paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees. Same thing happened here. So we're talking about, quote unquote, boycott the state, right? Or boycott is something that's coming up. <laughs> but then you're actually empowering the state. You know what I'm saying? So there's people, I think, uh, good actors with people. Like, yeah, I'm really trying to do something who can get, who can get caught up in that type of uh, organizing. Right. Mm -hmm. But then there's people who are conscious actors who know exactly what they're doing in terms of this. What I would call, you know, uh, ambulance chasing during the Black Lives Matter movement, following ambulance after ambulance, killing after killing and doing the same thing over and over again. with No actual material change happening. We're seeing the same thing happen right now. You know, so I think it's uh, important that we understand how the state will essentially deploy <laughs> state controlled activist influencers uh, who are designed as well to essentially warp people's minds on, on social media and get people to buy back into this uh, state apparatus rather than uh, buying into the people, into the liberation of the people, to the liberation of humanity. You know, so I think it's uh, important that we're able to understand these different tactics that the state uses and be able to attempt to divorce ourselves from these uh, colonial tactics and start thinking about what is actually it mean to build for a revolutionary strategy you feel me what does it mean to actually do this work day in and day out and actually build true autonomy so that the people can become uh the driving force for material change because right now it ain't yeah i don't know there, there's something uh that i think is really nasty as it pertains to like western egoism mm -hmm. where <laughs> uh, like for real like it's like here we seem to think that we have the ability to i'm speaking just in reference and i'm trying to be very careful about how, how i frame this but i'm speaking like okay if we're talking about that's what i was getting at earlier right where again what we saw in 2020 where you had like these uh paid actors these controlled opposition even controlled opposition if you black there is the possibility you know depending on how tied in you are with the state you know like a nigga could get pulled over and get smoked on accident mm -hmm. you know like or you might have if you an opd if you're in oakland and you uh you know are pushing for a neoliberal shit and you happen to be black there's a chance that an undercover pig might be following mm -hmm. you you not they not tapped in not knowing that you know you damn near agent of the state unwittingly and mm -hmm. they, you know undercover how they get down out here and they might pop you you still have the potential to be a victim of okay, the police yeah. state right but what we're dealing with here is like where you where i where i think the element again this heightened nastiness is none of us have to deal with what's going on in palestine so for us to think that we can actually be the vanguard, that we can actually be the legitimate force, at best, all we can do is support. And we need to be very uh, real with ourselves of what mm. our support is actually doing to mm. combat uh, the conditions, the, the settler colonial mm. genocidal conditions of the Palestinians. Right? Yeah. Like we need, you need to be rooted uh and like a clear and objective reality and not get too caught up right and that's i don't want to downplay what anyone's doing right like i'm not going to knock anyone who's protesting i think when you holding up the port and preventing uh missiles and whatever any other tech or even food being shipped uh to support the idf and whatever other fucking uh paramilitary uh forces that the united states and nato is sending over there i, ha I have to commend that but also uh, just be real about what you're doing and not getting too caught up mm. uh because the west does want to make you think you're doing more than you actually are and i think that's part of that that, that western, western chauvinism you know, type yeah. of mentality right because even when there was that temporary truce mm -hmm. right there were organizations saying we won this 
We won this Nigga, for the Sean Palestinians. Nigga, Sean came out and was saying he was helping getting hostages back. You feel me? Like, let's be real. Because these same, that's what I'm talking about. These <laughs> like same actors, you feel me? These same activist influencers that are backed by the state. You feel me? The same Sean King that was taking photos with the police, NYPD. But isn't that part you know of the saying? nonprofit and the part of the, neo the neoliberal campaign is to make the people here legitimate and seem as if they have more power than they really do? When you feel actually, me? Bro, it's them people. It's the like, Palestinian resistance that won the truce. You feel me? Like, let's be real. Like, let's not act as nigga, if you don't sit on the they UN care. Security Council for let's one. not act as if the government cares about protests in this country. There was anti-war protests when Iraq happened. You feel me? The war in Iraq happened. You feel me? It was uh, the biggest anti-war protest known to date. And what did the well, United that's States why we're here do? To teach history, yo. You feel you me? A lot of people don't understand exactly. That, that's like, but it's like we get caught up in the emotional without the actual objective, but that's that Western concrete. Egoism. Facts, you feel me? Where we, we think get caught our up in our emotion. Is the only thing is the biggest thing that's happened. Straight this up. might be the most support that <laughs> Palestine has received, yeah, for sure. Uh, Which is important. That's you feel me? Like it, like don't get me wrong. I do support protesting, mm -hmm. right? But when protests become essentially in like this rat wheel of going in circles and circles and circles with no actual direction, you feel me? Mm -hmm. No actual concrete programs that are being built in the community. No actual autonomous. Uh, institutions being built that serve the people and that advance revolutionary struggle in the United States of America. And instead, you have organizations that are leading these quote unquote protests saying that we only vote for politicians who say free Palestine. Again, this is the part of the containment strategy of saying, oh, send these people back to voting, <laughs> send these people to buy back into this quote unquote American system of quote unquote democracy. But that's, that's what's that, happening yeah. in real time, right? So it's like, yes, that's what I'm saying. There's conscious actors moving things in certain ways, while there's also people who are getting into the streets and politicized for the very first time uh, about imperialism, about capitalist imperialism uh, that aren't very much familiar with all of the nasty work that's happening behind the scenes to be able to control movements, to move them in a certain type of way that actually benefit the West, right? Because reality the reality is, historically, mass protests in the United States of America, they don't transform the conditions. It's in a process, it's part of the process uh, of galvanizing the masses of people. But if there's no autonomous programs, if there's no development towards a revolutionary struggle and revolutionary organization and building revolutionary programs to where we can actually become our own liberators, Essentially, you're just going outside and yelling at people. You feel me? Uh -huh. Using the war in Iraq as an example, that didn't stop the war in Iraq. You feel me? The United States of America still has military bases in, in Iraq. You feel me? So, like, let's, let's not pretend <laughs> that our protests are the center of why there was a truce or the center of how that's going to stop and ultimately free Palestine, right? The Palestinian resistance is going to free Palestine. Uh -huh. And the best way we could support that is by engaging in revolutionary struggle in the United States of America to free the land from Euro-American settlers. Man, you know? That's, that's again, it's that Western chauvinism, Western egoism, uh, thinking that we are at the center of the world. <laughs> um, even, you know, you talk about the Vietnam War. It wasn't the anti-Vietnam. It wasn't the anti-Vietnam War protests here that stopped. It was the, the Viet, Viet Cong. Cong. The Viet Cong, Ho Chi Minh. And what was the Black Panther Party doing to the, to the Viet Cong? Ready to send people Ready to send Panthers to that, the Viet Cong that, to support, support the material struggle while also engaging in... Uh, revolutionary struggle here in the United States of America. And again, like you, I'm not against protests either. Yeah. I just think we have to be conscious about uh, the impact that they're actually having. And before we can even get to what you're talking about building programs, we first need to get real and get mm -hmm. and get, uh, get rooted in reality. Because that's why we've seen the same thing happen, bro. The same thing in 2020. Niggas was talking about abolish the police. And then some of these people were saying abolish the police. It's not working with the police. You feel me? And since 2020, the police have killed more people every year. So they what are we talking about? And then y'all were telling us to go vote for Joe Biden. What did Joe Biden do? Created more genocidal conditions for Palestinians. Put more police like you was talking about. Mm -hmm. You feel me? So again, we're seeing the same ploy by the state to get people invested into the state. Invested in quote unquote voting rather, in, rather than being invested in revolution. Yeah. I mean, I think you know? the, the a high mark of cognitive dissonance is... I will only vote for those who say free Palestine again. This is what like, happens this when is, Donald Trump says free Palestine because the far right is saying this is a part of our agenda now. I mean, it's just because it's just, we want a new yeah. wave of imperialism, a new age of imperialism. It's just what miss, happens. It's just missing the mark, you know, and I think. Uh, George Jackson told us about this. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, ultimately, Palestinians you know? have the right to build their country as they see fit. Yeah. 
my sure. politic is anti-genocidal. You feel <laughs> me? And so I'm against genocide. I don't care what the Palestinian, like I support Palestine not being a settler colonial place, a settler colonial nation. That's a basic Now, if they there, if the Palestinians say, wake up tomorrow and say, no, we want a two part, a two state solution, right? If the Palestinians in mass say that, if the Palestinians in mass say, we want a two state solution, we want a NATO base here, we want this and that, uh, that's their prerogative. I'm still going to remain anti imperialist. You know, what's. Mm -hmm. What Palestine wants is it going to govern my politics specifically, right? Yeah. As long as Palestine is, the masses are pushing an anti-colonial, anti-settler colonial politic, anti-imperialist politic. That's what I'm getting. I think we as folks here in the belly of the beast, like you said, the best we can do, the best support we can give is actually build. I think the protest is uh, important, but to me is how do you support the protest and then condemn Hamas? You know, it's just like she's just getting... But then you have you business. have liberal Zionist organizations now being seen as the face of quote unquote protests in here. You know what I'm saying? We've seen like Jewish Voice for Peace, a liberal Zionist organization that still believes in the quote unquote state of of Israel, mm -hmm. right? We have people, New Africans, revealing themselves to be Jewish at a time to now never ever spoke about that, but now using that as a weapon to be able to get funding the for the nonprofit. Man. You know, so on the wall. we just have to be very clear. And that's what I mean. The nasty like, things that are happening. That's fucked up. Honestly, you know like, that's, like, that's insane to use Palestinian genocide as a means to come out as I'm Jewish, thus trying to legitimize yourself. I'm black and Jewish. I should be able to. I know that uh, this that where you get that whole intersectionality shit where niggas be tripping. I'm black and Jewish. This is my identity. African American. I have the double oppression. You feel me? Like who better than me to speak to how we can heal this thing? Straight All the time, your ass don't know. No history on the, the the historical development of settler colonialism. You don't have no analysis on on capitalism mm. and all the material ways that it manifests throughout life. That's what we're dealing with here. And until people talk about capitalism, colonialism, neo-colonialism, settler colonialism, imperialism, anything else just allows uh, anything else is just either going to point us into is going to point us towards integration mm -hmm. and allow the system to continue to grow. Yeah. What are we doing to actually combat imperialism here? And that's 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 what we have to ask because that's who the true enemy is. And uh, hey, I think um, this is a perfect time as we talk about the true enemy, as we talk hmm. about folks not getting caught up in uh, Western propaganda and Western chauvinism and missing the mark and cognitive dissonance. When we talk about what's actually happening to combat imperialism, mm -hmm. we have to talk about what's happening in the Red Sea. Straight up. Without question. Straight up. We've seen <laughs> revolutionary anti-imperialist movements <laughs> uh, that is showing humanity what how to truly be a humanitarian. Mm -hmm. You know, revolutionary humanism, is high, <laughs> one of its highest forms, in, right. my, in my personal opinion. Uh, straight up, you know, we're we're seeing uh, <clears throat> revolutionary Muslims engaging in revolutionary solidarity with the people of Palestine. Mm -hmm. Even if it means themselves being hurt, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, looking at what's happening in the Red Sea, uh, how have you made sense uh, of this recent military actions taking place in the Red Sea, and how do you see the ex the actions uh, of Yemen uh, and Iran uh, as anti imperialist? Well, first, I think. Uh... I look at first. I'll talk about like the West, right? I look at the actions of the United States and the UK. That was last week. They they bombed some ships in Yemen, right? I look at that. Yeah, they bombed Yemen. Yeah, they bombed Yemen. Mm -hmm. I uh, I look at that and targeted ships as well. Mm -hmm. I look at that as in a, an effort to advance Western uh, imperialism, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Western mercantilism, right? The ability to amass wealth through trade. Mm -hmm. uh, I look at that as actions directly linked to their support of Israel uh, and settler colonial mm -hmm. genocide, right? Um, the actions of the West are what's necessary uh, to maintain this type mm -hmm. of society. When we talk about the welfare state, let's go, you know, we talk about the welfare state. This is what's needed mm -hmm. for us to have the nonprofit industrial complex. This is what's needed for us to have the laptops, for us to have the phones, for us to have the cars, for us to have the clothes, for us to have the movies, for us to have the football. Uh, for us to have the work from home, for us to have all elements of our society, the United States and the UK have to do what they're doing. They have to support Israel. 
they have to seek to uh, neutralize uh, the indigenous revolutionary rebels, mm. right? Uh, for the imperialists to thrive, the highways of commerce must flow and the indigenous rebels have to be wiped out, <laughs> period, right? And so I personally believe, right, uh, anyone who's anti-imperialist should be supporting the actions of Iran and Yemen, right? Because what they're saying is we will not allow, again, if you have an analysis, you recognize, right, where Jalil says in uh, phase three mm. of the three phase theory, uh, the strength of the new African nation will be felt uh, in armed struggle and as well as uh, strangling the uh, U.S. economic system via mass strikes and demonstrations. Well, what's a higher form of demonstration? What's a higher form of strike than blowing up your ship to where you can't trade? What's the higher form of demonstration, a higher form of strike than making sure these missiles, mm -hmm. making sure this food, making sure this technology, this equipment can make it to Israel? Uh, what's what's a higher form mm -hmm. of that than blowing up a ship than killing them? <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I don't yeah. want to make it clear. I don't because you know you got... I you mean, gotta, but you gotta even, make it clear because then they just put somebody on a oh, terrorist yeah. list. So oh, yeah, I don't no, support I mean, terrorism. I do not support but what terrorism. They, what they have done is they've engaged in humanitarian struggle, right? That's what they have if done. If you against settler colonialism, they've right? engaged we know where these in pure humanitarianism because even their, their uh, military actions have also uh, engaged in humanitarianism, humanitarianism and principles uh, of egalitarianism through their military actions. Right. So if we looked at when Yemen took over an Israeli backed uh, ship, right, they did it through a helicopter operation, right, landing on the ship, right, sending smaller type uh, vessels through their Navy uh, to essentially seize a ship. Right. Then the people who were working in the ship, they showed videos of them like sitting down, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> They'd be chewing, I think it's called like what or something like mm -hmm. that. They'd be they was all hanging out, you know what I'm saying, listening to music, being treated humanely, mm -hmm. you know, because they realized that their war wasn't actually with the workers on the ship, you know what I'm saying? Their war was with the owner who was an Israeli billionaire. You know, so we even seen through that versus the way Israel, the so-called nation state of Israel. Uh, the settler state of Israel has been engaging in the mass slaughter of Palestinians, the mass slaughter, you feel me, of women, children, and men. And that's why I say Yemen has responded in a very uh, humanitarian way yeah. as a very humanitarian issue of stopping the flow of goods that is hitting them economically while also showing incredible restraint <laughs> uh, in, uh, in terms of military maneuvers and actions. And then they they never have reached the barbaric levels of the United States, mm. NATO countries, and Israel, right? Straight up. And, but I would say, again, if you're anti-imperialist, you should be supporting mm -hmm. the moves of Iran and Yemen on the Red mm. Sea. Like, right? If you're one of them people here who I think there's like been a slogan, like, no business mm. as usual, right? Where they've been like, oh, we ain't about to go back to yeah. work. We're about to be on the... Pro well, what's a higher form of no business as usual? Then you can't trade. You can't send these ships. You can't send this cargo. We can't send this oil. What you said the other day, shell back that we will not be going to the Red Sea. Yes, what's no business as usual? You can't drive your cars. You can't get this oil. You can't fly your jets. What's, mm -hmm. That's the highest form of no business as usual. Saying. We've seen Yemen and Iran attack Israeli link ships. People should stop down. them hey. <laughs> from going through the Red Sea and protecting the territorial sovereignty of their own waters and stopping this uh, Israeli genocide of Palestinians. We've shut down the port here multiple <laughs> times, right? Some people shut down ports. Some people blow up ships. If it's all in the name, but hey, that's and what is having a long term impact. I'm where just saying what allowed you feel me. <laughs> the shell just said they ain't shipping through the Red Sea no more. Them sh the people haven't shut down the, tr the port is still being traded. People shutting down ships. These people are saying we're shutting down the ocean. You can't come here. <laughs> if those shit leave, the, like, you can leave yeah. the dock, but you can't come through here. And the Red Sea is the most. One of the most important trading routes, even historically. historically yes. You know what I'm saying? This mm -hmm. goes back to 3,000 years uh, BCE with the, you know, Egyptians uh, sailing, you know, uh, through parts of, you know, East Africa, common day, uh, Somalia, or, or Eritrea, you feel mm -hmm. me? So historically, you feel me, they've, it's been such a vital corridor I just throughout be history. Because, you know, they might say we're supporting terrorism because they... We're just pointing to a, objective facts. We're also pointing towards the sovereignty of waters. I mean, what right? did Malcolm say? Malcolm <laughs> said that the media, you got to be careful with the media because they'll have you uh, hating the oppressed and loving the oppressor, mm -hmm. right? They call the Black Panther Party terrorists. Ter 
But what were the settlers of this country, right? And it's funny because army terrorists. In the Declaration Mm -hmm. of Independence, you had the United States of America uh, give certain charges Mm. against Great Britain and its king, right? Uh, One of them was uh, for Mm. plundering their seas, ravaging Mm -hmm. their coasts, burning the lives, burning the towns, and destroying the lives of the people, right? Deploying large bodies of armed troops among them, and then protecting Mm. those troops by way of mock trial for murders they might commit against Mm. inhabitants of the state, right? Doesn't that sound like terrorism and then what if the what if the settlers go and do you feel me kill all the folks indigenous to this land then take us from africa bring us all across the world mm. so what what's really terrorism mm-hmm. but again so i'm saying like you can't we can't the oppressor doesn't get to define the playing field exactly. i don't get to i say this all the time i don't get to slap you and then say hey you only get to push me back though or kick me <laughs> no by then you i've, I've opened it yeah you get to engage me how you want to engage it's game and so I think, uh, again, my my thing is, if you can support protests in the street, if you can support uh, shutting down the ports of Oakland, mm. if you can not go to Starbucks, why you can't get behind Iran and Yemen? That's the, like, what are some of the reasons that people might not get behind these two countries? Allahu Akbar. <laughs> <laughs> because biggest they say one. God is the greatest. That's the biggest one. You know, realistically, that that is the reason, right? It's because uh, at the foundation of the resistance is being Muslim, right? Islam is at the foundation, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, We know that the West essentially has launched a new crusade against Muslims uh, in West Asia, right? So it's easier for people, especially in the West, uh, where people are more quote unquote secular, right? And they can get back behind secular movements, they'll have more popular support for secular movements, right? Where well, you'll see people be like, oh yeah, I support Yemen, but I don't support political Islam. Right? <laughs> we see this mass propaganda of Muslims of these uh Muslim male beasts, you feel me, who need mm-hmm. to be civilized, right? Mm-hmm. And this again why I call it a new crusade is because if we look back like historically what i was talking about we talk about the red sea being a vital area for uh, africa asia and europe you know what i'm saying uh historically uh three thousand years before christ you know it was egypt you feel me that was uh, uh really in control you know in terms of like trade you feel me uh through you know modern day somalia uh and editra you feel me then uh Obviously, with the Roman Empire coming in, obviously, I'm giving a fast, <laughs> you know, fast uh, conceptualization of history. Mm-hmm. You have the Roman Empire, right? Uh, then you have the rise of like the Islamic Golden Age in terms of uh, trade and commerce, right? Which took trade to the new levels, uh, essentially new levels, right? Heightening of, of trade and new o- economic opportunities uh, for the Africa, for, for uh, West Asia, Asia and whole, right? It was a whole trade corridor. But then you see the reaction to the uh, uh, rise of Islam, the Islamic golden age, is the uh, Western imperialism, right? European colonialism, you know what I'm saying? To where uh, Europeans came in and now held captive these trade routes, which was in direct response (laughs) to the rise of uh, the Islamic caliphates, right? Um, So again, this is like that war, right? Then you see the Suez Canal being built um, with the support of France to where France had a 99 year <laughs> lease in control of the Suez Canal. So essentially Europe was controlling the most impactful uh, artery uh, artery <laughs> uh, for trade, right? But then in 1956, you had uh, Egypt nationalize the Suez Canal, right? Which, which led to the uh, Suez crisis. Right. So here we again in 2023, we're seeing this historic trade route come under contention by Western imperialism to have control of trade, to have control of capital, to have control of commerce at the highest degree, to have control of oil uh, so that uh, these Europeans can con- continue to rape and pillage the resources and control the people uh, for their mass profit. But what you have again now is you have. Uh, an, an indigenous element, uh, an indigenous, uh, indigenous element of Muslims rising up, developing national unity, developing Islamic unity uh, to essentially expel Western imperialists from the region. A part of that 
expelling process <laughs> is controlling the Red Sea. It's controlling vital trade routes um, and putting them back into the hands of indigenous people, whether they be Muslim or not. Right. So that's what we're seeing uh, being seen as a threat is essentially this unity of Muslims, which kind of goes back in many ways uh, to time periods, epochs, historical e epochs before where Muslims were controlling the Red Sea, uh, where indigenous people were in control of commerce, indigenous people were in control of trade. We're seeing this rise of indigenous people claiming their humanity and saying we were going to control this region for the benefit of our people. So we're seeing the West, of course, go on a what? Another crusade mm -hmm. to be able to stop that from happening. So there is no, so there's not another, you know, uh, uh, indigenous movement where indigenous people are controlling the resources. Indigenous people are controlling the shipping lanes. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And they're saying, yeah, we can. I mean, realistically, people have the right to self determination, and you can engage in trade in a way that is equitable for all nations, mm -hmm. <laughs> as best as you can, if you move towards a revolutionary system of trade. Oh, yeah. You feel me? So I, that's what we're seeing. And they hate it so much because it's Muslims. Oh, yeah. You feel me? It's Africans. It's dark people of the world rising up and saying we're human beings and that we have the right to self-determination. We have the right to uh, be true human beings. We have the right to shelter. We have the right to control our land. We have the right to water. We have the right to control our own resources. I mean, this is what uh, freeing the land looks like. You know, I think when people just use it as an empty slogan, like to free the land means to have complete control and autonomy over all elements of life, all elements of life, right? And I think all that history you just named uh, is, an, is, is an, a perfect example of why we need to study more, right? Because it's through the understanding of history that you are able to make sense of the current reality. When you have this history of the Suez Canal, when you have this history of the Red Sea, when you have this history of how uh, this land, this water has been used for sustenance and life, you can see why imperialists seek to control it and why the revolutionary indigenous seek to free it and without the history then you reach haphazard conclusions as to why this <laughs> is going on like everything ain't just about uh, people hating li life and liberty and hating the west right like when you understand historically what this land has meant to muslims right like when you understand this is this is their lineage their history their god-given right even if you don't believe in god this is this is their natural whatever term you want to use <laughs> Historically, this is theirs. They're indigenous. There are you. Are, they are, they are, the, these people are foreigners, dog. Yeah. And that's that Western chauvinism, that mm -hmm. Western ego, egoism, where it's just you. You just so wrapped up, wrapped up in your own mm -hmm. program, your own desires that you forget these people exist outside of your framework and your understanding. Just because you don't know the history of Islam, don't mean it ain't thousands upon thousands of years of it. Just because you come to understand. Uh, Iran through the warped Western propaganda. Uh, that's not all there is to it. Just because you want to come to understand Yemen, you want to come to understand Iraq, it, it, that's not there, all there is to it. And we got to get real comfortable saying, hey, I know these, these niggas ain't telling me the truth. Therefore, I should probably be mm -hmm. quiet and just study more. Exactly. Because and we're learn seeing, a little bit more before I reach a conclusion. What we're seeing again is the America, it follows the same playbook and just changes it a little bit. You don't even got to know a lot about Islam or yeah. the Middle East or Africa or nothing. Just learn about America and this history here. And you recognize that these niggas do the same thing everywhere they go. You feel me? Just learn about your history. Because we're seeing the same thing right now with the war on terror, right? We're seeing the same repetition of jargon that was used in the quote unquote war on terror, mm -hmm. which was what? A war in Africa and a war in West Asia. That's what it is. We're seeing this repetition again of a war in Africa and a war in West Asia. Because why? <laughs> Europe and Euro Americans, capitalist imperialism, they want to control Africa, they want to control Asia, they want to control Europe to the interests of capitalist imperialism. It's very simple to understand. It's very simple. <laughs> That's why it's going down in the Red Sea. And inshallah, the indigenous people will be victorious, control their trade routes, be able to trade equitably, you feel me, for the liberation of humanity. <laughs> So I know we went over a lot. Listen to this episode, re-listen to it. Do your Googles, you know, do some research. What's some texts or some websites you will get people to go look at? I don't want to just say do your Googles because niggas might read some crazy shit. Like I read an article on the Washington Post a couple of days ago on uh recent strikes in the Red Sea. And of course I'm able to sift between the mm -hmm. lines based off my own political education. But yeah, I would say Bro, me, you know what we should do, we should link to some shit. Yeah, we'll we'll put some links on our Patreon of, of uh, different we say that often, but we don't sources. Ever do it. 
So yeah, I'll, I'll, we need to do that. I'll take personal responsibility this uh, time and I'll, I'll add some links on like our Patreon. Links. You feel me? So like, go to our Patreon. You can look at here's the book. But whatever. personally, for me, my process is I do both. Mm-hmm. I read what the Washington Post says. I read what CNN says. I read, you know, I was just talking about Fox News and what Fox News was saying. I read all, all of them so I could get an understanding of A, what the enemy is saying, right? Where their direction is, what agenda they are trying to set, right? How their propaganda is being used to wage war. So I, I got to have a full understanding of that, yeah. right? And then I will go, you know, to different, uh, you know, channels, mm-hmm. uh, different people who are, you know, uh, indigenous voices to the region. Then I will do additional history uh, research on history of, of the areas of movements, um, different, you know, revolutionary media organizations uh, that, you know, have grassroots voices, have grassroots opinions from people indigenous to the region. Mm-hmm. Right. So you can essentially try to understand uh, what is being happening. You know, it is an analysis that you can just develop overnight. Without question. You, you know, you got to have an understanding of the geopolitics. You have to have an understanding of the history of the social conditions of the people. You know what I'm saying? To be able to try and sift through all of the propaganda. You know what I'm saying? And come to a concrete analysis on what is happening. You know, so it's it's hard because this is war games <laughs> right yeah. now. You know, so it's a, a lot of propaganda. So being able to sift through it is difficult. And I would say people you know, got to get comfortable with the... Just taking a learning stance and being patient with learning and recognizing that, you know, mm. uh, it's going to take some time before you can form an analysis, like you just said. And I also want to, um, I guess, like warn people. Oftentimes there are folks here who can tell you everything about what's going on internationally, but clearly based on their practice, can't fully grasp the terrain here. And I would say they don't grasp the terrain of imperialism because they do nothing to it. Uh, you can't understand imperialism without understanding your own. They haven't door. changed themselves. They haven't changed their block. They haven't Feel changed me? their family. They haven't changed their community, right? And so uh, I think, you know, you got to find that balance, right? Only time will tell. But I always say the high, like so- Sophia Bakari said, social mm-hmm. practice is the highest criterion for truth. And so if you truly understand imperialism, you're going to work to combat it in Straight your locale. Up. So be sure to tap in on our Patreon, patreon.com slash hellblackpod. If you like this episode, you feel me, go subscribe. We're going to have links to resources, links to different articles to be able to give you some type of understanding and some of the uh, sources and citations for this episode. So you feel me, tap in with our Patreon, patreon.com slash hellblackpod. Be sure to go to our YouTube, you feel me, go over there right now, subscribe to our YouTube, uh, watch it on YouTube, share it with your friends, you know what I'm saying? Uh, engage in conversation you feel me think with us you don't got to think exactly like us uh we to the homie left you feel me but yeah tap in patreon soundcloud apple Podcasts, subscribe wherever you get your media at uh and continue to build with us but most importantly you know we got to build programs revolutionary decolonization programs uh and build autonomy you feel me so support people's programs uh support hell black podcast free to people free to land